Eagle Communications is your complete business solution with options to fit any budget. We provide business class phone with customizable features and fast, reliable internet. Your knowledgeable team at Technology Solutions has a broad base of IT services to meet your needs. Let the experts at Marketing Solutions get your message to the right people on the best platforms. Eagle Communications will build your personalized business plan. Call us at 877-61-EAGLE. Eagle Community Television presents Community Connection with your host, Mike Cooper. Welcome to Community Connection from Eagle Community Television. Thanks for watching, and thanks as always to the producer and editor of our series, Brandon Cooley. We're in the studios of Eagle Community Television with the adjunct curator of paleontology at the Sternberg Museum of Natural History, Mike Everhart. We should add author in that as well, too, with the new second edition now of Mike's work, Oceans of Kansas, which we'll talk about in greater detail here in a few minutes. Let's start, if we could, with that first introduction of the second edition, Mike, back on National Fossil Day, which took place at Sternberg October 14. Uh, what's the idea of National Fossil Day? Well, it's, it's a main uh, a way of recognizing paleontology as a science. Uh, everybody's interested in dinosaurs, but paleontology actually encompasses so much more about prehistoric life, about understanding the ecology of this planet millions of years ago, and what that really means to, to us today. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the things that we're observing with um, life on this planet in the modern sense compared to things like the great extinction that it, extinctions that have mm -hmm. occurred over uh, hundreds of millions of years, including what happened to the oceans of Kansas. So understanding the past uh, is a biological science. It allows us to understand what's going on today and possibly what's going on in the future. I'm glad you mentioned that, Mike, because there is a link between the past our present as well. Certainly, and it's an important link. <laughs> we're, we're part of the, the life or the ecosystem of this planet, and unless we understand how we fit in and how we affect um, the rest of the world, uh, we're really kind of in the dark. And that's part of what we learn from the science of paleontology, certainly, right? Certainly, certainly. Give us a little history of uh, paleontology, if you would, uh, maybe on a broad view worldwide, and then maybe we'll narrow it down because Sternberg obviously has been a very big part of that. Well, certainly. Uh, paleontology didn't start off as a science. Uh, basically started in Europe. People collected things like ammonites, um, fossil sharks' teeth and things like that, but didn't understand that they were what they meant. They didn't understand life millions ago, millions of years ago. And it, about, about 1800, when some major fossils were beginning to be uncovered in mines in various places, people began asking questions. Well, what, what are these things? What do they mean? What, uh, you know, uh, these things obviously aren't around today, so we had developed the whole idea of extinction. You know, certain things are no longer here, therefore they're extinct. Uh, Paleontology became, became kind of a gentleman's hobby. It was uh, the upper class, the rich people who could afford to buy fossils and, uh, and uh, display them in their cabinets and really were kind of the, the leaders, I guess, in bringing some of these things to public attention. But then we began to find more and more of them and particularly in the United States, uh, the farther we moved west, across Kansas in particular, the more fossils were found uh, around and people had to start looking at them, examining them in terms of the science and the, the things that they represented in the past. Dinosaurs were first discovered in Europe, but one of the best early ones was discovered here in western Kansas in 1871 by O.C. Marsh of Yale College. And it was found out by Russell Springs. It's a little dinosaur, it's only about 15 feet long, but it is still on display in New Haven, Connecticut in the Peabody Museum of Natural History. So that's a, a really important, uh, to me anyway, uh, discovery here in Kansas. But after that, uh, things really kind of 
mushroomed, or we had kind of a fossil rush here in Kansas in the 1870s because of the discovery of Elasmosaurus out by Wallace, Kansas. Uh, the first type specimen of our, of our state fossil, Tylosaurus, was discovered by an army officer by Monument Rocks. Uh, the first Pteranodon, the first uh, giant turtle called Protostega. These things had never been seen before in science and all of a sudden Kansas is the source of all of these new fossils and, and people are scrambling, competing with one another, particularly in Marsh and Copes. Uh, uh, views uh, over what these things were, what they represented, you know, which is the biggest one, and everybody was rushing to name new fossils from Kansas. Mm -hmm. It was a pretty exciting time for about 10 years until, of course, then we had dis uh, dinosaurs discovered in Colorado and then up in Wyoming, and it, the fossil mania sort of moved westward after that, but Kansas has continued to produce new species of, of, of these prehistoric animals. Uh, we continue to send uh, specimens to museums all over the world. Uh, you can go into Paris or London, uh, Berlin, and find Kansas fossils. It's, it's really kind of a neat uh, connection with the rest of the world. And really a central theme of Sternberg Museum and its work in those, in those days. Certainly. Uh, you know, we don't have a lot of dinosaurs here, we have a few, but we specialize in marine fossils from this, this period during the late Cretaceous. Uh, we were a seaway, um, we had lots of giant animals here, mosasaurs and plesiosaurs and, and flying reptiles that are, are not seen any place else. And the chalk beds along the Smoky Hill River are actually the best place in the world to find these things. It's a wonderful resource that very few Kansans know anything about. Part of your attraction, I would think, to Sternberg and to this well, certainly. Uh, part of the state, and, right, Mike? Yeah, and it's, I guess, part of my mission, <laughs> if you will, is to make this known to, uh, to people here in Kansas. It's something we can be proud of mm -hmm. because this resource is something nobody else has. Mm -hmm. And we've got it here and we've had it for the last 150 years. Um, and have <laughs> literally been mining it mm -hmm. in terms of, of the fossils that it's producing, but there's a tremendous amount of science that goes along with, mm -hmm. with those bones. And of course, obviously, one of the worldwide um, discoveries was George Sternberg's famous fish in a fish. Certainly. There's quite a story behind that, Mike. Yeah, well, and actually, the, uh, he, he didn't discover the fossil. Uh, he had a couple of paleontologists from the American Museum of Natural History out in the field with him. He was just showing them around. They were on their way to California, and one of them found the tip of the tail fin of that fish coming out of the uh, chalk. And he pointed it out to George, and George, of course, recognized what it was and, and uncovered the, the tail fin. And, uh, you know, that was about it. They needed, they were only there for a day or so, and so they needed to move on to California. And he would continued to dig it up, and he continued to contact the American Museum and ask them if they wanted it. And, you know, he'd get it exposed, and he knew he had a complete fish. And then he found the fish inside the fish. Mm -hmm. And at every stage, he would talk to the museum and say, look, your, you know, your discovery is really nice. And they said, George, you dug it up, it's yours. And anyway, we've got one that your father gave, sold to us back in, I think, 1913 or something like that. Mm -hmm. So George dug it up and um, he literally stayed out there for over a month on the site camping out uh, to ensure that cattle or people didn't mm -hmm. step on his fossil. And in 1952, the university got some help out there at the time. When he was ready to get it out of the ground, the crew came out from the university and helped him dig it up and transport it back to the museum on campus at the time. And then it was prepared and, and put up for exhibit at that point. And at that point, then it really started to draw, attract attention and became famous. Um, Life magazine actually photographed it and and put it in one of their issues in 1952. And the uniqueness was that it was a more complete 
specimen as opposed to, as you have said, uh, bits and pieces in some uh, digs. Yeah, that was one of the draws. There had been, he and uh, Charlie and his father, Charles Sternberg, and George and the brothers had collected several of them. In fact, one of the first ones is, is in the uh, Museum of Natural History in London. Mm -hmm. But they, in, in many cases, weren't quite as complete, and they certainly didn't include the six-foot-long fish as a, as a last meal. Mm -hmm. uh, we find these things even today that include bones of, of what the fish was eating at the time. But in this case, the fish was, was essentially complete. It hadn't been digested, and it indicates to us that the larger fish died pretty quickly mm -hmm. after swallowing the, the, the smaller one and mm -hmm. went straight to the bottom, and nothing scavenged it. It's not torn apart. There is one break in the, in the tail vertebra that happened after it hit the, got to the bottom. But other than that, it is essentially complete. Every bone is in place, and it's just a beautiful specimen. That's the fascinating thing about paleontology, Mike, ah. is that you can learn so much from things that are millions of years old. Certainly, and that's, that's been one of the changes, too, that, that we've seen develop over the ages. Um, the first collectors were, were basically collecting curios, uh, things to display. They didn't understand the science. And then you got into, the, into Kansas in the 1870s and Cope and Marsh looking for the biggest this or the, the fish, fish <laughs> whatever, the, the most complete or things like that, and naming everything they found. But now so the science has gotten to the point that we're looking for the details. We want to know what these feet... Uh, fish or what the animals were eating, uh, what they were uh, doing in life, how, how long they lived, what, you know, in the case of the reptiles, were they covered with scales or not, uh, you know, lots of things. And even, you know, we, with, uh, with Dr. Wilson's work now, we're looking at mm -hmm. inside the bones mm -hmm. to find out, you know, how old they were, uh, what their growth was like, did they grow really fast, did they grow slow over a long period of time. So there's a lot of information in the bones that nobody had even considered 100 years ago. And it's, it's telling us, again, more and more about life at that time and how it compares to life in our oceans today. Before we get into the book uh, in our next segment, Mike, I did want to mention Dr. Laura Wilson, as you said, your boss, basically, right. who has been able to achieve uh, some remarkable success with grants and improvements in the paleontology department, which big things are coming out there, Mike. Right. Uh, the biggest thing that's coming up very shortly is our paleontology laboratory, preparation laboratory, where we'll actually be able to take the, the fossils as we collect mm -hmm. them out of the ground and put them on you know, temporary display and actually show the public how they are prepared and, and preserved, I guess, as, as best we can, uh, right there, right in front of them. And so it's, a, it's an, a unique opportunity for us, finally, to get a prepar preparation lab and to, to do better science. Um, every museum has got more fossils than they can possibly display. And in a lot of cases, uh, we have a backlog of fossils that we haven't even had a chance to prepare. Mm -hmm. So this will give us an opportunity not only to prepare some of our older collections, but also to train students and to give the public an idea of what we're doing and how we're doing it. And I remember that uh, even in the original location of Sternberg back on campus, there were displays that, uh, or there were fossils that were not able to be displayed, and still that's the case because of uh, uh, space constraints. Oh, certainly. Um, in terms of the number of specimens we have out there, I think that our sp uh, collection number right now, just in terms of the vertebrate animals, the, the fish and reptiles and things like that, is 18,000. I mean, obviously, we're not going to display 18,000 fossils. And for the most part, those aren't displayable anyway. They don't, they're not something that the public could look at and actually get something from. And some of them are just little tiny teeth. Uh -huh. So uh, collections are complex. We try to have the most informative things out on display. And we also have 
things that are just basically pure science that you know we can compare things back in the in the collections area and write papers uh, describing things that uh, are meaningful in the science but not necessarily something uh, that the public would readily understand in that two or three minutes when they walk by something on display. The book is Oceans of Kansas, second edition, The uh, Natural History of the Western Interior Sea. Our guest is adjunct curator of paleontology at the Sternberg Museum of Natural History, Mike Everhart. We'll find out about uh, the emphasis of the book as our community connection continues. Eagle Communications is the leader in advertising services. We take the guesswork out of marketing your business. From creating the message to managing the campaign, Eagle can make your business stand out. Meet customers where they shop. Take your business online with a digital campaign and showcase your products on TV and radio. Let me help you reach the people that matter most by targeting demographics and using platforms that are proven to make your business grow. Call today. Eagle Communications, our community connected. Hi, I'm Brandon Cooley, and I'm the Video Production Director at Eagle Marketing Solutions. We're a full-service production house. Service, to me, really is everything. I think it's very important that we show our clients that we really have their best interest in mind. Video is very engaging. It's really the best platform to tell your story. We pride ourselves on attention to detail, creative concepts, and fast turnaround. We're always working to find new ways to make our product better and to be able to just do what we can to help the client tell their story in the best way possible. The book, available at several locations, including the uh, Expedition Bookstore at Sternberg, Amazon, and other multiple locations, Oceans of Kansas, A Natural History of the Western Interior Sea, second edition, which was rolled out during National Fossil Day back on October 14th at the Sternberg Museum, with author Mike Everhart. Well, obviously, the first question, what prompted the original edition of Oceans of Kansas, that it's story. Kind of, it's kind of a uh, complicated story. Uh, actually, the, the name Oceans of Kansas comes from a discussion that my wife were having back in the, in the 1990s when we were trying to you know, come up with a name that was encapsulating what we were doing because we were out here three weekends a month uh, wandering through collecting things and trying to understand uh, what we were seeing in fossils. and uh, I started looking for information on the internet back then. Of course, the internet in the 1990s was much more primitive and less informative than what we see today. I couldn't find anything. Mm -hmm. So the name Oceans of Kansas popped up and then we built a website in 1998, about 20 years ago, and started putting information up as I found it. And by about 2002, I started getting inquiries from people wanting to buy the book. Well, there wasn't any book, but I, I guess they assumed because of all the information, the pictures, the stories that was available at that time on the internet, that there had to be a book somewhere behind it. So I threw a proposal out to uh, a couple of print, uh, publication, pub, publishers, excuse me, and the first one, University of Kansas, turned me down because there was a possible conflict of interest with, with another person at the museum that wanted to do a fossil of Kansas. Mm -hmm. And then I uh, actually sent it down to Oklahoma University Press because I'm originally born in Oklahoma and I felt mm -hmm. some, some tie there. But they'd also done books on the Sternbergs and on Williston and various other K Kansas paleontologists. Mm -hmm. They lost it. <laughs> 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 it got set on the desk and they got a, something stacked on it, whatever. <laughs> Called me up a couple of months later and said, uh, would you still give us a chance at it? And I thought, no. Um, at the time, Indiana University Press uh, was, was really the leader in doing most of the paleontology publication of books in the United States. And so mm -hmm. I sent it off to them, just kind of wondering if they'd be interested. And they wrote right back and said, yeah, uh, how soon can you have it? Oh. So here I am, I proposed it, I had two chapters written. The pressure is on. Pressure is on. And, I, and at that point, I suddenly realized that I didn't know nearly as much about paleontology in Kansas as I thought I did. I mean, mm. I, was, I thought I was pretty good, but I learned <laughs> pretty quickly. 
And so uh, we got it together. Uh, the first book came out in June of 2005. Uh, they only print, you know, they were taking a chance on me, so they only printed 1,700 copies. And surprising to them and to me, they sold half of those before the book was printed. That's kind of like, whoa. They sold out the first month. They printed another, uh -oh. another 2,000 copies really quick, and then Discovery Channel Book Club picked up the book as their book of the month or something and mm -hmm. printed another 2,400. And all of a sudden, we'd sold like five or 6,000 books in that first year. And I'm no competition for Harry Potter or you know, popular fiction authors, but 6,000 nonfiction science books in, yeah. in a very limited field was pretty impressive. And that is impressive. I ran into uh, later that year at the uh, Society of Urban Paleontology meeting in, in Mesa, Arizona, I ran into my editor and he knew me by my badge, and I didn't quite recognize him, but he said, you're making me a lot of money. And okay, <laughs> I want to explain. Uh, but it turned out, of course, you know, that he was getting paid uh, by the, as a project, but mm -hmm. as an author, I wasn't going to see anything until uh, five months later after the, you know, the first royalty check came out. But it turned out, turned out real good. I would advise people that want to write these kinds of books that don't give up your day job. You're not going to make that kind of money. <laughs> but I didn't do it for the money, and I was just amazed at the reception. I think they were too. It turned out to be their best-selling mm -hmm. book that year. And uh, it was kind of like, wow, uh, I can do this. There is an interest in this paleontology right. stuff. Right, and it was. And it, and it, one of the things that they, they said about that book and, and also about this one, it's the best and only book about the Western Interior Sea. Mm -hmm. It's a fairly short period of time in terms of paleontology, um, but it is the last time that an ocean actually covered Kansas and the, and the Midwest. But for all of the history that's involved in it, very few people have sat down and actually written uh, about the discoveries mm -hmm. and, and how they came about. And that was the part that interested me, was all the stuff that was going on, in, in fact, during the Indian Wars in, in the western part of the state. Um, Fort Wallace was certainly involved in the 18, uh, 1867 uh, when Elasmosaurus was found out there by a military doctor. Mm -hmm. um, all of the things that were going on at the time, you know, it turns into a fairly fascinating story of discovery and intrigue and also the competition between Marsh and Cope and a lot of, a lot of stuff that was going on out there that people have kind of lost sight of over mm -hmm. the last hundred years. We want to explore that website of yours too, Mike. Uh, how do we find it? Uh, oceansofkansas.com. Okay, very it's simple. Not, it's not hard to find. Oh, okay. And, and it's, it's an information website of your, yeah, your work. It's total, well, of my work, but also the work of all the other people that have, have been here over the last 150 years. And it's a huge website. I mean, if you're interested in the clams that live down at the sea bottom, there's a page on that. If you're interested in the mosasaurs, mm -hmm. plesiosaurs, there's several pages on that, tooth birds, and all of the other creatures that were here um, I've got something down there that, that will give you some background, and, and it's also well cited. It, you mm -hmm. can look, you can go back to the original references in most cases on this stuff. Uh, give us a time frame of the oceans of Kansas, could you, Mike? Well, one of the things that people in Kansas don't understand are, is that all of the, the mineral resources in this state are the result of oceans, mm -hmm. sea bottom, oil, gas, salt, gypsum. Uh, limestone, mm -hmm. all are products of oceans that covered the state for probably at least 300 million years uh, from the Mississippian time on up through the Cretaceous. Oceans of Kansas focuses on the last ocean that occurred here from roughly 100 million years ago to about 65 million years ago when the great, when the plains were literally lifted up above sea level for the last mm -hmm. time. But prior to that, Kansas had mostly been underwater for a long, long period of time. The Cretaceous oceans um, are my favorite, I guess, because this is during the age of dinosaurs. 
Earth is a water planet. Uh, it's a warm planet. We don't have any glaciers. We don't have any ice caps. There's no really winter anywhere. So mm -hmm. Kansas is a tropical environment. Uh, we have huge sea creatures, mosasaurs and plesiosaurs, and of course the, the pteranodons. And you know the, the oceans, the seaways cover 85% of the surface of the earth. Everybody gets excited about dinosaurs, but they were all packed into this, these little land masses uh, scattered around the world. Uh, the, the, the planet was really covered with water. So mm -hmm. those are the animals that, as far as I'm concerned, were really the, should really be the focus. It should really be the age of, rep, of marine reptiles, not mm -hmm. necessarily the age of dinosaurs. So that's kind of the time frame. I focus in here on Kansas in a period of about five million years between 87 million years ago and 82 million years ago when the Smoky Hill Chalk was being deposited over much of the Midwest. We see a lot of it exposed here in Kansas along the Smoky Hill River, but it goes up under Nebraska all the way up into South Dakota. And it's basically the center of the seaway at that time where the water was probably nearly crystal clear. Uh, there were billions of out little shelled algae uh, forms that, that were here that were the, the bottom of the food chain, if you will. Everything mm -hmm. fed on them, and their shells uh, accumulated on the bottom to form the, the mud, the, uh, the chalk. But it was a very productive sea, seaway, um, probably very similar to the Mediterranean or the Caribbean right now. Uh, had huge predators that grew, mosasaurs grew up to 35, 40 foot long during this time period. And so you had to have, you know, all kinds of other larger mm -hmm. animals out there that they fed upon. And it was those literally teeming with life. Teeming with life, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we collect more mosasaur material here than anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And all of the, just about all of the pteranodons, these giant flying reptiles are found here in Kansas giant fish, uh, the fish within a fish at the Sternberg Museum is about 13 feet long, but we know it grew to 18 foot long or longer. I mean, that's a middle-sized Zephactinus. Uh, a 20 foot long Zephactinus would have just, you know, blown, <laughs> blown your mind. I mean, a big tarpon on steroids. <laughs> and then we had sharks here that were up, were over 20 feet long, uh, long neck plesiosaurs, uh, that were, you know, up to 40 feet long, and half of that is their neck, uh, something that there's really no modern creature like that, and we're, we're still trying to understand what it is they were doing with that huge long neck out in front of this four-paddle body. Mm -hmm. Giant turtles the size of, of small cars, um, all kinds wow. of other um, creatures uh, in, be in between and whatever that were very interesting. Uh, the first toothed birds were found here in Kansas and are, are literally from this time period the only places that complete specimens of things like Hesperornis and Ichthyornis are found. Uh, we find their pieces and parts of them other places but here you can find actually complete specimens. We've got a a new one at the museum that uh, is not to be re not reported yet, but maybe one of the most complete specimens ever found. Uh, so paleontology goes on even after 150 years. Mm -hmm. We're we're still finding new things from the Smoky Hill Chalk, and this is what the the book is is uh, based on, I guess, or primarily all about. And the second edition is kept in capsules encapsulates uh, the last 12 years of research and all of the new things that have been have been published during that time period. Plus I've also was able to go back uh, with modern technology and, and uh, the fact that we've got newspapers online now that you can go back and look at the 1860s and 1870s and read some of the stories of that time and find some discoveries. And I found out that yeah, Cope and Marsh get all of the, the modern um, news, I guess, or modern comments mm -hmm. about what they found and what they, their, their rivalry and so on. 
but it was our own people here um, that were collecting here before Marsh and anybody else was out there. I only have a couple of minutes left, sure. Mike. I've got to get to the heart of uh, your interest in paleontology, your mentors, the people who got your juices flowing. <laughs> Well, uh, it really goes back, as I mentioned in the, the front of the book, to my fifth grade teacher, a uh, uh, lady by the name of Vivian Louthen that uh, was interested in rocks and fossils at the time, but she conveyed that interest to me and some other students and really got me started. I started looking down at the ground. I started collecting uh, my part of the state. Uh, Fossil, they weren't Cretaceous fossils, they were more of the Pleistocene material. This was in Oklahoma, right? Uh, well, no, I was in Kansas at the time. At Kansas. Okay. But uh, in the riverbed type stuff where you're getting mm -hmm. buffalo teeth and various other things. And she mm -hmm. got me started looking for stuff and, and curious about what, the, what they were. And then I had a, a very good biology teacher at, at Derby Senior High School in, in south of Wichita and some good people out at... Uh, at the University of Can or excuse me, Wichita State University. Don't want to get that wrong. <laughs> uh, Dr. Tash there that took me out on my first paleontology trip to the chalk. And it just kept building on that interest. I'd always mm -hmm. been involved pretty much in fossils, but uh, I kept building on that over the years. And um, of course, two careers had <laughs> gotten away, military <laughs> service. But I always came back to paleontology and then in the late 80s, my wife and I started seriously collecting out here. And that's when I got in contact with Dr. Zakchevsky at the museum. And mm -hmm. we kept bugging him because we <laughs> wanted to compare the things we were finding with what he had in the collections. And uh, finally, he gave up and, uh, after about six, eight years and, and actually nominated me to be an adjunct curator at the museum. So that, that kind of grew. But... Uh, it's been a lifelong passion, if you will, and culminated in, in something like Oceans of Kansas. Well, in addition to being a curator, I would say professor should be added to that. We have learned a tremendous Certainly. amount, Thank you. Mike, from your expertise, and we appreciate your time. Thank you. Christmas present for you here. Believe me, history book. Perhaps a science book, uh, perhaps even a little bit of mystery involved there. The Oceans of Kansas, A Natural History of the Western Interior Sea for the adjunct curator of paleontology for about 20 years at <laughs> Fort Hay State University and the Sternberg Museum of Natural History. Mike Everhart, our community connection. For over 60 years, Eagle Communications has been the leader in value and service. And over that time, our specialized teams have been helping businesses grow because Eagle is your one stop for business solutions. We can provide the latest in hosted phone, reliable fiber internet, IT support, business compliance, and network planning. Plus, we offer affordable advertising on television, radio, and digital platforms. Call our employee owners today and let us serve you. Eagle Communications, our community connected.